Howdy folks, so this is going to be the first in my series of electronics tutorial videos on practical electronic design. So, this particular video, actually it's going to be a series of two videos, is going to be on inductors and transformers. Now I'm not going to go into deep theory on uh, why everything works and all that sort of thing. You can always look that up online on your own time. This is more for practically designing and using inductors and transformers. So, let's start out by talking about some of the basic parameters of transformers and inductors. Probably the most obvious thing to start with is your core. So you can see here we have some various types of cores. This right here is a toroid. These are E cores. This right here is a binocular type core. These are more E cores. This is uh, stacked two on top of each other. This is also a single E core with a part down the middle. This is a air core, Tesla coil resonator. As you can see, it's got no core. And this over here is the inductance and saturation detector. And I will actually talk a little bit more about him in just a minute. So let's talk about one of the very basic parameters that we're going to need to calculate and design our transformers inductors. The first and probably one of the most obvious things that we should talk about is core material. Now there are very many, many flavors of cores that you can buy online. And that ranges from everything from ferrite to iron to powdered iron and to even some of the more exotic materials like cool mew and uh, some other variants. So for simplicity in this video, we're going to talk about just iron cores, powdered iron cores and ferrite. Now, iron cores is probably something everybody's familiar with. This is basically a good example. This is a layered or laminated iron core with an air gap. Now, I will talk a little bit more about air gaps in just a minute, but iron cores, an important thing to note about iron cores is the frequency range that they can be used in effectively. Now, iron is a, a very electrically conductive material. It uh, has a very low resistance and therefore if any kind of voltage is induced in the core it will actually short in the core and end up as heat heating up your core and that ends up as core losses. Now this particular voltage induced inside the core is known as uh, eddy currents. Well it's actually not a voltage but it's a circulating current in the core and it's known as an eddy current. Now this eddy currents gets worse with higher frequencies. So generally speaking, iron cores are really no better than, uh, are really not very useful up to say 50 kilohertz. Any higher than that, and you risk the, you risk actually losing most of your energy in your core due to heat. Now you can see that the lamination here helps a little bit. It actually separates the sections of the core and prevents eddy currents from circulating because these are all, each one of these individual sections is uh, isolated from each other electrically. However, you still can't go much higher than uh, 50 kilohertz with something like this. This is a little bit better. This is known as a powdered iron core. Now these are E-core sections. And uh, powdered iron is essentially a bunch of iron granulates. So it's a bunch of little iron particles and they're suspended in a binding agent such as epoxy or uh, something similar. And uh, this is a little bit better than iron because uh, Essentially, it has a distributed air gap all the way around it, and uh, all the particles are isolated from each other. So, as a result, you can generally use powdered iron cores well into uh, into about 100 kilohertz or so, maybe even a little bit higher if you're if you're feeling adventurous. Now, uh, the exact frequency that you can actually use for something like this or this can usually be found in a manufacturer's data sheet. They will usually give you a uh, core losses versus frequency and flux density parameter in their data sheet. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Now, last core we have here is ferrite. Now, ferrite is a, a ferromagnetic material. It's not quite as electrically conductive as iron, and as a result, it can be used well into the megahertz range very effectively without too much core losses. Once again, this, is plot, this uh, depends heavily on the mixture of uh, ferrite and the way it's baked and so on. And there's every flavor of the rainbow of ferrite. So uh, do be careful on what you choose. 
over here we have, uh, once again, so anyway, the next parameter I'm going to talk about is cross-sectional area. Now this is a very important number. Now the cross-sectional area is basically the area in which the magnetic field flows. So let's take this toroid core for example. If we have a bunch of windings wound all the way around it, essentially we're going to have a magnetic field that flows in the core in a circular direction like so. So the cross-sectional area will actually be the cross-section, the area of the cross-section of this ferrite core. So the way we'd calculate it is we'd take this dimension from here to here, this dimension, and we'd multiply it times this dimension, which is the height. So if we actually cut this core in half, you'd have the, that would be the cross-sectional area. For something like an E-core, that's found by multiplying this dimension times this dimension. And as you can see, it's pretty self-explanatory once you start looking at it. If we have a winding going from here to here, like this core, we can see that the magnetic field is going to flow in this direction, and therefore, that is your cross-sectional area. Something like binocular core might be a little bit more difficult to calculate, but it's still pretty simple. You just look at your winding, it's going like so. So if you actually cut the core in half, once again, that's your cross-sectional area. So, now that we understand how to calculate cross-sectional area, which, by the way, should be calculated in meters squared. So, that's important to know, because all the equations we use, you're going to use SI units, and uh, they should be in their base unit, which is meters squared. So, for the next parameter is uh, geometry. Now, geometry is, uh, is, is, is important for particular applications. Now, something like uh, an E-core, exa exa for example, here, is very, very good for adding uh, an air gap. Now, an air gap is important when you want to increase how much, um, well, excuse me, it's going to increase at what level your core saturates at. How, essentially, how much of a magnetic field can your core withstand before it saturates? It can no longer sustain any more magnetic field, and at that point, it drops down to zero and acts just like an air core. Now, flux density is an important parameter, and I'll talk about that now. Basically, flux density is measured in the units of Tesla. And uh, Tesla, it basically states that for a given cross-sectional area, we can put so much flux in that area before the core saturates. Now, for iron cores, the saturating flux density is a lot higher than what you'd find for something like ferrite. Ferrite is in the range or in the order of about 0.2 to about 0.4 Tesla. That's usually the general range at which ferrite will saturate. For iron, it varies very widely, and I'm, I won't go into that too much. You can usually find this data once again in data sheets for cores. Now, when you add a uh, air gap, you actually introduce a small amount of air core into your magnetic circuit. Now, when you do this, you drastically increase the amount of uh, flux density that your core can handle before it saturates. But the trade-off is you also drastically decrease the amount of inductance that the core will actually have for a given an amount of turns. So you're essentially trading off peak current in your core for your peak inductance how much inductance you have in your core. So keep that in mind. Those are two parameters that you, you will actually have to trade off when designing inductors and, in, and transformers for that matter. So let's go over here and talk a little bit about some math. So we're going to start out with this equation. This is the general equation for an inductor. And it states that voltage equals inductance times the change in current divided by the change in time. Now, this equation is very important for when you want to calculate both the inductance and when you want to calculate saturation point of inductor. Now, generally speaking, I don't calculate the saturation point of inductor. The way I usually check saturation point in my inductors is I go about actually testing them, and I do that with this device. This device is very, very simple. Essentially, all we have here is a large capacitor, in this case, it's about 300 microfarads at 200 volts. And we have an SCR. This SCR is uh, 
essentially, I believe it's about 150 amps, several hundred volts. And then we have a current shunt. This current shunt is in series with the inductor and it is generally connected to an oscilloscope over there. So essentially what the current shunt does is it basically takes the current flowing through the inductor and converts it into a voltage that the oscilloscope can look at. And we will use that extensively. So let me show you how we go about doing this. So here's the circuit for the circuit that I was just showing you. We have this capacitor here, and then we have a supply in which we charge the capacitor with. You can either have a bridge rectifier here and charge it with a variac, with the AC, or you could use like a lab supply and charge it from that. So what we basically do is we start off by charging this capacitor up to about 20 or 30 volts. It doesn't have to be very much. It just has to be enough to saturate the inductor. And you can usually find how much you have to fill it up by by experimenting. So start off low and uh, then slowly work your way up until your inductor saturates. What we do is, is we, so we start off by charging this, uh, this capacitor with this SCR off. So this SCR is essentially blocking the circuit here. So the, the only thing in the circuit right now is this and the power supply. So we charge it up and then we, when we're ready we disconnect the power supply and we trigger the SCR. So when we trigger the SCR all of the power stored in this cap dumps into our inductor under test. Now when this happens the inductor will actually start to, uh, the current through this inductor will rise linearly with time as dictated by this equation. If we backwards solve and we have a constant voltage and we have a constant inductance, this current will charge linearly with time. And what we get is a waveform that looks like this. Now, Here's the interesting part. So you can see here, this is where the SCR triggers. And you can see here, the current starts rising linearly with time. And then we hit this point. Now at this point, what happens is that, that knee in the current there is your saturation point. You can see right at that knee, that's when we hit our peak flux density in our core. Now this particular core under test here is a ferrite core and with ferrite you get a very quick saturation. So you can see here as soon as it saturates it, the inductance rolls off very very quickly and you get a very very sharp increase in current because the inductance has effectively dropped to a very very low level and there's not very much impeding the flow of current from that capacitor through that inductor. This basically comes a short. So this value right here is your saturating flux density. So you know exactly where that point is. And you can actually use, as you can see here on this scope, this value is in, is in uh, voltage. But using, if you know the ratio of your current shunt, which you should, you can use that to find your current. Now if in this particular example, it's a, it's a one to one ratio, and it's millivolts to amps. So essentially, 22.4 millivolts essentially denotes that this point right here is 22.4 amps. So this inductor saturated at 22.4 amps, the inductance dropped, and it rolled off. Now once again, you can increase this saturation point here. You can actually make it a higher value by adding an air gap. Now, an air gap is very useful. You can continue to add air gaps and check for your saturation. But the thing you got to remember is, is that as you increase your air gap, you also decrease the inductance of your core. And uh, it's a trade-off. So you got to have a particular amount of turns and a particular size core in order to have the inductor that you want. Now, the other thing that's very important with uh, inductor design here is the actual inductance. Now there's two ways that you can use. Now most people don't have an LCR bridge. An LCR bridge is what you can use to actually test inductors at various frequencies. And uh, those are usually pretty expensive. I don't even own one and I really wish I did. But So the way I go about calculating inductance is uh, there's two methods. You can actually use your waveform here and you can actually look at the slope of the line where it's linear and you can put that back into this equation and solve for L. So if you know your current, you know your time, and you know the voltage that you charge this capacitor to, you can backwards calculate inductance. The other method that I've used in the past 
is, uh, and it works a little bit better because you can test at other frequencies, is you essentially put your inductor, let's see if I can do this draw, in series with a capacitor, or in parallel, excuse me. You have this connected to ground, and you connect this to a signal generator of sorts. And then you look at, on the same, same probe, you look at this with a scope. Now, assuming you know the value of this capacitor and you don't know the value of this inductor, you can actually put a pulse into the inductor, like so. And what happens is, is when you put this pulse into the inductor, it'll charge up the capacitor because it's going from here to ground. And then when you shut it off and there's no more connection to it, it'll actually ring. You'll actually get a sinusoidal ring. And it'll, it'll decay down to a very small value and ripple out. Now this ringing here is a function of the capacitor charging in, or discharging into the inductor and then the inductor charging, recharging the capacitor and basically constantly exchanging energy between each other. Now the frequency of this ringing will actually tell you the value of your inductor and the reason why is because if you know the value of your capacitor you can use the equation for an LC circuit which almost everybody should know. This is an advanced electronics tutorial. And uh, you can actually, assuming you know the frequency, you know the capacitance, you can calculate the frequency of your, or you can calculate the value of your inductor. The other way to do it is you can actually apply a sinusoidal waveform using your signal generator. And uh, what will happen is, is the sinusoidal, you basically adjust the sinusoidal uh, current, or voltage, excuse me, until you get the highest peak value at your oscilloscope. And that peak value can also be used to backwards calculate your inductor because that's the point of resonance for a parallel circuit. You can also do it for a series circuit, but it'll be the reciprocal. So those are the two methods you can use to calculate the inductance of an unknown inductor. And I will do a later video actually going through doing this on some of the tools to show you how it works. For now, that's all I'm going to talk about the theory of inductor design. On the next video, we'll talk about the theory of transformer design. And then on the video after that, we'll actually do some practical tests using inductors and transformers. Until the next video, part two.